Hey guys, Britt here. Welcome to End Times Bible Prophecy. Make sure to hit the subscribe, like, and share buttons. Well, we need to be praying for peace right now. There's several news stories I've been following for the last several days. I'm sure you have been as well. That should be concerning to all of us because of the implications of what's being talked about. And I'm talking about the war in Ukraine and the NATO stance toward Russia and what's taking place there. So let's take a look at the first of these articles. This one right here is from the Daily Mail. It's from two days ago. It says NATO and EU countries are considering sending troops to Ukraine. Slovakia's pro-Moscow PM Robert Fico claims. Now this is from two days ago, this has been confirmed and then denied and confirmed and denied, but we know they've been talking about it. So it says NATO and EU countries are considering sending troops to Ukraine, Slovakia's prime minister has claimed. And it says it's extraordinarily claimed as if this is just absurd. The leader who has long opposed military supplies to Ukraine. Here, here we go with the, <laughs> the narrative and this is supposed to be a news story. But they're putting a lot of, when you see adjectives in a news story, especially a blatant overuse of adjectives in a news story, they're trying to slant it a certain way. It says, who has long opposed military supplies to Ukraine and has taken a position seen by some critics as pro-Russian, said today he learned of the idea via notes ahead of a meeting of European leaders in Paris. While well, he added that he did not know what troops would be doing in the war-torn country. I mean, I would assume going to war. What other reason would you have for sending troops to the country? He said a move like that will likely lead to escalation. And guys, that's exactly why we need to be concerned about this. Because this definitely would be an escalating move. And the issue we talked we talked about this a year and a half ago or more about the prospects of escalation in Ukraine due to a miscalculation on behalf of NATO or Russia, one side or the other. This isn't a matter of which side is right, who's evil, who's good. This is a matter of two opposing powers. We've got Russia on one side, really NATO on the other. We can talk about Ukraine, but Ukraine would have been conquered a long time ago if it weren't for NATO supplying arms and intelligence and helping Ukraine. So it's really, this is a, you know, a proxy war, but it's Russia versus NATO we want it to remain a proxy war or come to a complete, preferably a resolution, a peaceful re resolution, because if this escalates and becomes a direct conflict between NATO and Russia, we have two sides that have an enormous arsenal of nuclear weapons that would cause immense destruction. And we've talked in the past about They've war-gamed out these exact scenarios. In fact, this exact scenario with Russia and Ukraine and the miscalculations that were made led to a limited nuclear war with a billion people dead. That was, I think, a 2014 or 2012 exercise that was performed that showed that. So now we're talking about there are European leaders who are actively pushing the idea of deploying NATO troops into the Russia-Ukraine conflict. So let's follow up that last story with this one from CNBC. This is from yesterday. It says NATO countries scramble to deny ground troops will go into Ukraine after Moscow warns of inevitable conflict says France's suggestion that Ukraine's allies have not ruled out sending ground troops into Ukraine has caused indignation and outrage in Russia. Moscow officials warned 
that it would provoke a direct conflict between Russia and NATO member states. And I would say that it would. <laughs> I would believe them in that. Eyebrows were raised Monday when French President Emmanuel Macron suggested that European heads of state and Western officials had discussed the possibility of sending their ground troops into war. So guys, this is when I first started seeing these stories, there were other stories coming out that would say fact check, right? <laughs> so, so this is why this has started to pique my interest over the last several days because of several statements that were made. But then when you see the fact check articles come out and you go, oh, there's really something here. There's really something to this that they don't want to, to see. And one of those fact checks was on, well, yes, uh, P Putin said this was a red line, that if it was crossed would lead to escalation of conflict and direct war between NATO and Russia. But fact check, it was two years ago when he said that, not yesterday, right? <laughs> as if, as if, oh, okay, well, it was two years ago that he said it. So nothing to worry about here, right? No, no problem. This is no longer a red line because it was said two years ago versus yesterday, or even that it was not even that it wasn't said yesterday because Russia has <laughs> since come out and said that, but that while well, the video that went around on social media was from two years ago, as if that matters, we all know. I don't need Putin to tell me something to know what could happen and what the risks are. And my concern is we have. It, you know, at first, I thought, well, maybe they're floating these out for certain reasons we'll get to in a moment. But uh, I think I think they're just clueless, some of these leaders. And that, that's the overwhelming number, number one concern we should have, starting right here with the CNN article on Emmanuel Macron. So it says, Macron says nothing ruled out, including using Western troops to stop Russia from winning the Ukraine war. This is from yesterday. Hey, newsflash, regardless of what you think of what's going on, Russia has won the Ukraine war. Short of NATO directly entering the conflict, which I think would create a situation where no one could win the war because it would lead to nuclear war, Russia has won this war there. It, it, like it or not, that's the facts that are on the ground. And I think that's why we're seeing this posture being taken on and these leaders making these statements because there's it's an act of desperation. Well, what do we do now? Russia is in the act of winning this war. If we don't do something soon, by the end of the year, it'll all be wrapped up and over with. And then what? So they're desperate to stop that. And that's exactly what Macron says here. So here we read the statement he makes, which is should be very concerning. He says, nothing should be ruled out. We will do anything we can to prevent Russia from winning this war. And guys, that should... That should have the whole world concerned because, again, they've been doing what NATO has been doing what it can to prevent Russia from winning the war. I think we've passed that point in conventional terms, again, but deploying NATO troops into this conflict is an escalation that. I don't think any of us can know for sure what would happen, and there's a very high probability that it would lead to nuclear war. And so on those comments, we had these follow-up comments from, this is a BBC article from, I think yeah, maybe late yesterday, early today, NATO allies reject Emmanuel Macron idea of troops in Ukraine. And it says several NATO countries, including the US, Germany, and the UK, have ruled out deploying ground troops to Ukraine after Emmanuel Macron said nothing should be excluded. So initially, when I was seeing these things come out, I thought this is an act of desperation. What they're trying to do is maybe 
uh, plant the seed that they would deploy the troops so that maybe there will be a quick resolution on Russia's, depart, uh, on Russia's part to end this, where it stands right now. And then maybe the, the West could save face somehow. Maybe they're, but then what if you do that and you don't get the reaction you hoped for? So that's, that's taking quite a risk. Now it's become very clear and apparent that there is this divide between NATO with some that want to enter the conflict. Not by proxy, not by supplying weapons to Ukraine or intelligence to Ukraine, but we're going to supply our armies. We're going to deploy them to Ukraine to attack Russia, which, guys, would lead to a major escalation of the conflict, if not World War III. So, again, this should have us very much concerned, and so should this, which we see if you go to uh, the NATO homepage, you'll see front and center this statement from the NATO Secretary General. I'm going to play a portion of this very quickly because this should be even more concerning. So I'm going to mute my microphone, play this for you, and then we'll discuss. President Putin started this war because he wanted to close NATO's door and deny Ukraine the right to choose his own path. But he has achieved the exact opposite. Ukraine is now closer to NATO than ever before. We are helping to make your forces more and more interoperable with allies. We will open a new joint analysis training and education center in Poland together. And we are deepening our political ties through the NATO-Ukraine Council, where we consult and make decisions together. Ukraine will join NATO. It is not a question of if, but of when. As we prepare you for that day, NATO will continue to stand with Ukraine. So guys, this should be concerning. Look at the posture. Look at this just body language that is coming. And all of this is directed toward Russia saying, Ukraine will join NATO. It's a matter of when, not if. This is a very bold statement coming out from the two, around the two year anniversary of the start of this conflict. And here we have the NATO Secretary of General saying Ukraine will become a member of NATO. So if there's any thought about what that may mean, let's look at NATO's website again itself. And Collective Defense Article 5, it says the principle of collective defense is at the very heart of NATO's founding treaty. It remains a unique and enduring principle that binds its members together committing them to protect each other and setting a spirit of solidarity within the alliance. Collective defense means that an attack against one ally is considered as an attack against all allies. So I want you to think about what that would mean when we have the NATO Secretary General coming out and making the statement that Ukraine will join NATO. It's not a matter of if that's going to happen, it's a matter of when. What does that mean? Well, that means that the moment that happens, all of NATO is at war with Russia. And if that's not the case, then NATO as an organization doesn't exist anymore. Because that's the whole point of NATO, is this collective defense arrangement. So. He knows exactly what he's saying. There, it's this is a this this should be very concerning that they're saying these things because guys, this I don't know what their calculations are, what their thoughts are on what they think they're doing here, but we have historical record to look at where nations have often been governed by the ill-equipped. And we saw with World War I how quickly all of these leaders rushed into war thinking, 
our side's going to win a quick victory. And they had no idea what they were doing, what they were getting into. And our concern should be that the same thing is happening with today's leaders. And I'll put that in quotes and air quotes because this is not leadership. But guys, this, again, this could lead to, I do not believe this will lead to all out nuclear war in the sense of World War III the whole world is firing off nuclear weapons. I don't believe the Bible tells us that will happen because humanity is still here when Christ comes back. We know in Revelation chapter 6, there is a future global war. It does not destroy all of humanity. So I don't think that's coming. At best, this is a rumor of war, but we could also see a limited nuclear exchange that with devastating consequences, millions, tens of millions dead, and the implications for the entire globe, even, even in a limited, limited to that area of the world, it's the, the impact is global. It would impact every person living on the earth. And when I bring up the possibility of some of these things, a lot of people go, no, it's not going to happen because... Uh, everybody's going to be going about their business on the day when the rapture occurs, and therefore, if this happens, that won't be the case. And I would point out a couple of things. One, according when, while, while we can't know this for certain, it's believed that the United States has been at DEFCON 3 for going on two years now. Now, that DEFCON, it's a defense readiness condition. It's an alert system within the United States military related to nuclear war. If you're at DEFCON 5, it means, hey, everything's relaxed. We're kicked back. There's no problems, right? Everything's wonderful in the world. DEFCON 1, well, you're engaged in all-out nuclear war. So historically, we've only reached DEFCON 2 twice, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and I believe a single day during the first Gulf War. DEFCON 3, we've reached during the Yom Kippur War, Operation Paul Bunyan, 9-11. Uh, but these were short periods. They weren't two years long. We've been under this cloud of nu possible nuclear war at a, at a state that we haven't been in since the Cuban Missile Crisis for two straight years. And yet the world continues to go on about its business as if everything's fine. I would also point out terrible things can happen and then conditions could return back to normal. So just because we would expect the world to be unsuspecting when the rapture comes does not mean that terrible things cannot happen before that. So guys, we need to be praying for wisdom to come to everyone in a position of power on every side of this conflict. We need to be praying for peace. We need to pray that God will put the right people in the right situations. We've seen this throughout history. We saw it in the Cuban Missile Crisis where one person a submarine commander, a Soviet submarine commander off the coast of Cuba, that one person made a decision which averted nuclear war. We've seen it both in the United States and the Soviet Union in command and control centers, and especially in the late 70s, early 80s, where errant information came in that made it look like the other side had started a, a first strike preemptive attack and it turned out not to be true, but that one individual held things back, averted nuclear war for the world. So we need to be praying for peace, guys, because this is, there's a lot of things going on in the world. We have the end of the monetary system coming. We have, the, you know, many of these leaders know that's coming. Hey, what better way to cover up our mismanagement 
of that situation, but by blaming the collapse on a war. Or, you know, the West looking at Ukraine and saying, after what happened in Afghanistan, we can't afford to lose this. We can't afford to have Russia and China and the BRICS alliance that is coming together create this bifurcated world because it means a loss of power for us. And then you have people like Macron saying, we will do anything to prevent Russia from winning this war. Really, anything? So you will start a nuclear war in order to avoid that. Again, regardless of what your position is on who's right, who's wrong, what should happen, all that's irrelevant in the face of we all need to be working together to make sure this does not spiral out of control into nuclear war. Yet, many of the people in positions of power right now seem to have a very cavalier attitude toward that prospect. So that should have us all concerned. There's nothing I can do about it. There's really nothing you can do about it except pray. So let's make sure that we're praying for wisdom and praying for peace because this, again, this, this is a change in tone that I believe is distinct from what we've seen the past two years. And I believe it's coming because Russia has essentially won the war. It may not be over yet. The conflict may not be over yet. But there's no path to victory for Ukraine outside of NATO forces joining, which is no path to victory because, again, that leads to nuclear war. That's not a win scenario for anybody. So pray, pray for peace. Let me know what you think. Maybe this is just normal, nothing to be concerned about, <laughs> no problems here, don't worry about it all. If that's what you think, leave your comments below. In the meantime, make sure to hit the like, share, and subscribe buttons, and God willing, I will see you next time. Bye. If you want to learn more about the end times and Bible prophecy, make sure to sign up for my free monthly newsletter and get your copy of my free ebook, Seven Signs of the End Times. Just follow the link in the description to get your free book. Also, make sure to check out all of my books. Just look up Brit Gillette on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Apple iBooks, Google Books, Kobo, or anywhere books are sold. Thanks for watching today, and until next time, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith.